Why did your father have you drive 100 miles a day to attend school from eighth grade to 12th grade while still working on your farm? And how did that influence your approach to education and integrity? Well, my father was an immigrant um, from uh, Northern Ireland, actually, and he only had a couple of years of formal education. Uh, we were living west of Washington, D.C., and uh, I was going to the local rural school up until through seventh grade. Then high school came along, junior and senior high school. And uh, the local school, uh, no one went from that school to college very much. He wanted me to go to college. And uh, so he made arrangements for me to go to a school in Washington, D.C., in the Georgetown area. Quite a good public school. It didn't cost anything. He didn't have money, but it was. And so he arranged for me to drive in every day. That was for five years. The first year he drove, after that I drove, and brought my brother and sister along. And for him, and this is really important to me personally, uh, he was dedicated to my getting education that he didn't have. He thought that was really important. So uh, I still hold that as a <laughs> rather tre a treasure on his part. What is the state of American health today? Are we ranked 42nd, are we really ranked 42nd in health compared to other countries? Why aren't we doing better compared to other countries if we spend so much more on health care? Good question. Uh, the fact of the matter is those, those rankings of how well we do, they vary a little bit depending on what, you, what kind of metrics you put into that calculation. But uh, we're, we're ranked uh, 44th on a quarter of one and 28th on another, somewhere in that territory. We, we should be number one because we pay the most per capita for any, any country in the world. We use the most drugs, the highest use of drugs of any country in the world. So we've, we spend all that money using all that drugs. We ought to be ranking number one, right? If it's working, it's not. We're ranked somewhere between, depending on how you do it, counting life expectancy or you know, building services, whatever. Uh, we're somewhere in the neighborhood of between 28th and 44th, depending on how you add this up. It's just not a good record. You just published a paper wherein you hypothesize a beneficial effect of plant-based food consumption on COVID-19, not just by increasing comorbidities, but by directly increasing immunity to the virus. Can you explain this? Yeah, that's very exciting. Um, the coronavirus obviously uh, came and visited us just about a year ago or so. Um, and it turns out that when I first was hearing about that, uh, like everyone else, uh, uh, you know, well, what's the story here? Uh, and I recall that we had some data from our China study of over 30 years ago. And some of that information was an enormous amount of information, but some of the information concerned a virus uh, initiated cancer. I'm talking about liver cancer, primary liver cancer. And that's a serious virus. Some people list it as the most important in the world, 700 and some thousand deaths per year. That's nothing to sneeze about. So we collected a lot of information on all these different diseases in China, including that one. So we had a lot of nutrition characteristics. We also measured, mind you, this is 30 some years ago, we measured the prevalence of hepatitis B antigen, that's the active virus. We measured you know, who had that. And this is among some 8,000, almost 9,000 people. So we had that figure, the amount of antigen in these people. We also measured the prevalence of antibody. That's a degree of immunity, as you know. So we then could ask questions. What factors uh, controlled how much antigen, how much antibody? In other words, the active virus versus inactive. It turns out that uh, according to a number of different indicators of uh, food consumption, namely, especially concerning plant and animal food consumption, plant food, increasing plant food consumption increased the formation of antibodies dramatically, highly significant. We say a statistic, the P level of 0.001, for example. And that, that was not related to the formation of antibody, that was not related to the liver cancer, deaths from liver cancer. In contrast, the animal food consumption uh, there, which is, was very low by our standards, but it was enough. 
It was surprisingly, it was enough to give us some information. A increasing animal food consumption was as highly associated with antigen, the active virus. And it was highly associated with liver cancer. I mean, it could not hardly be clearer. Animal food consumption turns on the virus to cause liver cancer. Plant food consumption does the opposite. It makes antibodies. The, the question, and so that was just uh, announced uh, yes, uh, February 1, just two days ago. That was announced and now it's an official publication. It's open access, people can see it, they can have a look at my data. Uh, and I have never seen data quite like this that was so robust. That means it was highly statistically significant. Just to add one more wrinkle to that. At that time, given the animal protein was turning on liver cancer, so to speak, we did uh, that study, an experimental mice study. The mice had the gene for causing the cancer from the hepatitis B virus, okay? It turns out that liver cancer formed in those mice only when you were, we were increasing animal protein consumption. The same thing we saw in humans. You put two, two things together and then you compare animal food with antigen, animal food with antibody and vice versa. It, it's so robust. It's so robust and, and the information that we have there that no one else has to my knowledge, uh, it's about the same as it is for let's say prevention of heart disease and, and cancer in general, diabetes. So it's, just, it's the same formula, the same strategy, the same nutritional strategy, strategy that works on degenerative diseases also works on viral diseases.